everyone. We are live. This is 2OF Entertainment. Welcome to Canadian Art Today. With your host, Paul Constable. Well, if you didn't know it was Canadian art, man, with that flag just hitting you in the face and not the candy canes anymore, you know it's Canadian art today. I'm just saying. Yeah, <laughs> Canadian art today. Yeah. yeah. Actually, David yeah. looks pretty darn Canadian to me. He looks. I know he's good. all dressed up. Yeah. No, I've, yeah, I thought I had the horns fitted for Christmas. So I got this little green glow going on again today, but it's, it's good. Yeah. Results, you know? I think I'll have to do a little like David does have to compromise his red background and take that for myself what the hell there you go yeah. by the way happy yeah, new year uh, paul this is your I first show of 2024 it is uh looking forward to it and i'm in the studio here while i'm recording and it's just uh it is about 25 below outside we just all of a sudden and we have about a foot of snow it just overnight just wow. blew in as it was called a uh, alberta clipper is what we sure yeah. why not <laughs> And uh, wow. like the Montana low or whatever the heck they call yeah, that. Or Nor'easter right if you're in New York. Yeah. yeah. Very anyway, nice. Yeah, we got some shoveling yeah. to do when I finish up here. All right. Hey, it's good. January, yeah. it's warm in here. We got a great guest today. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I just, you know, I, I was just sitting there trying to write something unique that is about her. And uh, I mean, it's not that it's hard to write something, but. I guess today on Art Canadian Art Today, um, we have a landscape artist who has combined two unorthodox mediums to create her art. Now, this is a technique of weaving and hand painting the threads that you wow. put into the weaving uh, into landscapes that are representational landscapes. And our artist today is Jane Evans, and she's trained in fine arts from universities, holds degrees in literature and education, is a master weaver. She's been nominated for Canada's two most prestigious awards in craft, the Sadie Hoffman Award for Excellence and the Jean A. Chalmers National Crafts Award. She's also a member of the Saskatchewan Craft Council. And, uh, you know, her woven and painted artworks are in magazines, books, collections. She's got a book out that she's had a few years ago. She's a painter, printmaker, weaver, fiber artist who bravely goes where others fear to thread. God, I said it out loud. Oh, yeah. that's cute. Yeah. <laughs> well, does she, uh, Paul, Paul, does she have also have the largest business card in the world, do you think? That's I was just going to say, stuff. that and did she climb Everett's? Because that's, that's the only thing that's really literally missing from her CV. That's why so. you have a blank backside of your business card, just to put all that on yeah. there. And okay. uh, Jane works from her studio in the country and okay. is outside Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. So... Uh, well, like let's bring in Miss Jane. Let's bring in Jane. So, welcome, Jane. Good morning, Hi, Jane. gentlemen. Good morning. Yeah. Gen well, someone must have walked into the room. But so well, Jane, Jane is very, but, like she's yeah. very esteemed. So Jane's too esteemed for David and I. So we're gonna leave shortly. But uh, because <laughs> yeah. she's like she's like with that business card right away, we would have nothing to say. Oh, and I know what I forgot. You will be. Stephen, you will be happy to know that I don't have to put I climbed Everest. My maiden name was Everts. Oh my God. That's so too funny. I was almost yeah. there. Um, close enough. <laughs> so there you go. I love it. That's well, awesome. Just wait a minute here while we load up some files. I sure. forgot to do that while we were yakking. But uh, that's ha okay. well, happy, happy New Year, Paul, is all I can say. Well, happy thank you very much. Miss Jane. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being our first guest, Jane, in 2024. Of Canadian, I'm Australia. honored. Thank you. I truly oh, am. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we appreciate yeah. it. Yep. Well, you'll you'll yeah. appreciate the work that she's doing. Uh, she's worked for a long time doing right. this. But we'll talk with Jane as we're processing the the video part of our our show. I think we're pretty much ready to go. So all right. Well, then David and I will leave, and when you need your video, you let us know. Well, yes. There you go. Oh, we'll talk for a bit here. Perfect. Thanks, oh, guys. Okay. I, okay. Jane, a pleasure. We'll see you at the end. We'll do. Well, good morning. Good morning. Well, good morning. Yeah, you've got a. There's a soft glow about it. I don't know the the 
the image is softened up a little bit for some reason. Anyway, hmm. we're good. I get this green glow must going be, on. Must be, the, must be winter in Saskatchewan. It, it, there's something, yeah. I don't know. There's, <laughs> I don't know what it is anymore, but uh, you know, I was going through a lot of your work. I've known you for a number of years, uh, more than a number of years, probably. And uh, I thought, well, we, we always have, you know, painters and printmakers, and we have you know, sculptors on our show and a number of different things. And uh, and you you put these two mediums together that really kind of it it it's hard to imagine how people can do that. I know you're doing new works now, but we're talking about your previous earlier years that have, um, I guess, prefaced what you're doing today a little bit because. Uh, you know, we, we want to talk about how a person does this weaving. And you are a master weaver, by the way, uh, let people know that. And uh, the hand painting of threads that go into the weaving that depict landscapes. Um, and landscapes are what you love. Is that correct? That, Absolutely. Landscape? Yeah. That's so, it. Yeah, that's always it. have, always will, I guess. Yeah. So there's that trees are talking to you while you're walking and the breeze and the not so much talking to you, but yeah. I guess they're, I guess they are. I'm out of, there. Be, we are. live outside Saskatoon and between our land and our generous neighbors who don't live on the land, I've got two, over 200 acres wow. that I simply can walk on every day um, with my dog usually. And I, Everything out there is is alive and wonderful. It's it's really lovely. Therefore, the landscapes I make and have made for many years have absolutely no human artifacts and nothing with eyes because that's a whole different story. As soon as you see something with eyes, you build a little story around it. That's true. But if you just look at the the objects, the trees, the bushes, the, whatever you're looking at, they have their own story, and that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. No, very so, true. Out there, yeah. we am. I know as a landscape painter, we're always aware of, did I, is there those secret little eyes sitting in there? You do a sculpture, the same thing. Like you try to avoid those, maybe the faces that are unintended, that, that they just show up in your work. And right. That too. In, that too. In clouds and sky paintings, you know, there's this. Yes, yeah, that would get things you. Things do appear. Yeah, dogs even, <laughs> dogs uh, and sheep. And, and, and I... And I <laughs> I avoid any human artifacts like fence posts and old buildings. They're very, they're fascinating. But imagine as soon as you look at an old building, you, you build this story of what happened during the dirty thirties and all these things about it. And that isn't what I want to talk about. Yeah. So I think a lot of, yeah, a lot of artists do want to talk about that though. They, they, they exactly. Tend to and they do a fine job of it, but that just isn't my world. Yeah. There's a, I guess you're looking for that story. Like, and everybody says you should have your own story each work has a story. And I think even though you are, say you do our painting, a bluff of trees, um, there still is mm -hmm. a story there, but it's, it, mm -hmm. it's, it might be that, I guess the calm or the silence of that day or, or, or mm -hmm. I guess that's what you're trying to convey more is that love of that yes. land probably that's and yes. the love of the yes. trees and the things. Yeah. And yeah. how they're connected. And in fact, yeah. And we've lived here. We built the house here almost 40 years ago. And so I've been able to see a lot of the changes. Things that were just little trees at the beginning are really large trees now. And right. a number of them have blown over. And, and there's, there's all of that that catches my eye in a different way now. Yeah, there's, they are kind of like friends. I mean, when you do lose a tree you've had yeah. for a lot of years, you know, they are. They, you, you, yeah. You've sat under it and, you know, you've drawn it a number of times. Mm -hmm. You become somewhat yes. intimate. I mean, we've had other artists that draw trees and... They'll come back and visit that tree over a number of years mm -hmm. and they'll see it growing mm -hmm. or dying or doing different things. And they goes. continue drawing it. Yeah. And and, yeah. Uh, and then it's down yeah. and it's a stump. Well, let's just start with Pardon? our, we're just going to start up here and get the guys to start our slides up here. And there we go. Okay. Way back. Yeah. Well, I, I took liberty with what you gave me. And okay. We'll, Go not through. going chronological okay yeah well you know i needed something to to start you off with and i think it's about your hands okay that's fine i really like the obsessive compulsive person at work right okay shall i explain yeah. this one 
Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about. I mean, I'm not sure what you see in it. Okay. This is my hands at one of my old looms. I started weaving in 1971. Um, very, very simple belt type looms. And over the years, I progressed through a lot of things, had a lot of looms. This is the nicest one I ever had. Um, it's large. It's got very fine threads on it. What you see in my fingers are threads that within one inch of width, there's 70 of those threads. Wow. And on the right, on the right are um, textile paints in little film containers. And above me, that orangish area is a large printout of a photo I took of a stream. And I am carefully lifting those threads, and there's about 1,100 of them across the whole width of the piece there. I'm carefully lifting them and painting them with the textile paint so that later when I weave them, there'll be a background of a landscape there as that I'm weaving. The big sure. trick being, while they're being woven, the threads twist. So <laughs> you have to get the back as well as the front. Oh, right. So doesn't... And, so and this is something that back when I started doing it, almost nobody in official weaving did it. And I, it, I've started out as a standard textile fabric, towels, that sort of thing, weaver. But eventually imagery took over. I, I really wanted to do imagery. And that's not easy to do on a basic loom. And after 20 years of being a basic weaver and writing the book you mentioned, um, I decided that either I had to give up weaving or I had to find some way of doing images in it. And it pretty quickly developed into painting as a start. And then during the weaving process, I would uh, control the loom in such a way, and this was quite unprecedented at the time, I'd control the loom in, loom in such a way that I could insert textured threads called boucles or, or loop threads or whatever you want to call them. They were textured, which you wouldn't have been able to embroider in afterwards because they would have ripped. So they had to go in during the weaving process and they would stand out as a whole different texture and a whole different surface on this fabric. And then it all got woven up together came off the loom, and then the good old obsessive took over, and I embroidered it yeah. with free motion machine embroidery, okay. which is where you're using a machine, but it's just controlling the needle for you, which saves a million and one stitches, and eventually came up with a textured landscape. I think artists like that, the discovery path, you know, part of that, you know, we're discovering. Oh, I love experimenting. Yeah. Our Just new love way it. Of doing the, of the same, I mean, uh, I think they do that, like just typically with painting, they try to find their own new formula. They would mix up for their, their mixture of glazing and different things rather than buying something off the shelf. And uh, I think it's just trying to find their own voice, I guess, within the pigment that they use and the medium. Right. Yeah. And I, and I like, I thought this is so unorthodox though, that they're, you're mixing two media, but it does make sense. And he said, but it does look yeah. like you've made it really hard for yourself. It's sort of like I could take my yeah. canvas, take it all apart, paint every thread, then put my canvas back together again. Like <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. So you, yeah. 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 Decompose but it, it gave me again. the result I wanted. Yeah. Yeah. Disassemble it, put it together again. Yeah. So it's like, well, I did that for 20 years. I, you know, I, I didn't give up. I made a, a series that I called Places of Peace we because it was outdoor yeah. things. And I'm within that series over 20 years, there were 113 pieces that I felt were decent enough to frame. Yes. And yeah. that's what I did. Yeah. Well, let's, let's just see what we got going on here. Okay. So you also did that's, some, this is, uh, I showed a close up as well. They're seeing, you know, yes. Now, this you call is a rug that were, was, right. was done. So, how, how yeah. large was something this, like this? Um, about three feet wide, five feet long. Oh, really? Okay, so quite large. So, is this done on the loom the same way? You, and this, this was 
this was prior to the painting days. Uh, um, this this was um, it, it it's done on a loom, but again, it's it's an, a stage that was leading to the the paintings because it's the stage where I was controlling a lot of what the those threads going back and forth to the right and left are called wefts. The ones long on the loom are called warps. Ah. Now, I was controlling the, the wefts in a way that, again, was quite, un, it was not commonly done at all. It is now, but not then. Okay. And if you bring them up and down and choose where they're going, you could make this imagery. So, in fact, this is one step back from painting, but it is related. It, and it was all in my quest for imagery. So you use, is there a template that you use at some point or a reference material? Um, on the loom, underneath all the warp threads, I would have stretched a large piece of fabric, kind of like a piece of sheeting, uh, bed sheeting, with the general outline drawn on it with a black marker. So I knew quite just how far to go. Because every time you're working on the loom, you're beating these threads down in to pack in. And you ha you can't really say this is a graph paper of it as easily as you can just say, well, here's the line I'm following. Yeah, people have to really appreciate that. It's quite meticulous. You know, if you're out by one or two, I'll call them pixels, everything kind of mm -hmm. jumps over one way or the other. Exactly. You can't, you can't especially get exactly. nice lines and things. But right. I, really, so, I, really, I really like the aspect that this is very um, uh, like using complementary colors in this thing to make that thing glow like that background, the sky yeah. in behind there is uh, very impressionistic, you know, really in, in the Thank background. You. Yeah, it, it Thank you. Very, and if very, you notice in the rug detail there over where you take a look at that blue sky, it's actually not just one cross piece weft going through at a time, but there's a little yellow one with it. They, they went through together, they're twisted together in oh, really? proportions. So they yeah. change proportion and, and going, you can yeah, see certain things. It would drive me crazy doing this. I could not, I could not handle that. I'd have my brush <laughs> yeah. out and back painting it. Yeah. <laughs> You're not the first one to say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you have to have the right, the patience and the, uh, I yes. guess the temperament I'll even call at a certain point Oh, that's kind. Yes. It's obsessive compulsive. Let's fight, face it, right? Yeah. Well, I guess it's the same thing. Like quilters have that same thing that get, that gets right. in their blood, that gets in their blood and uh, that's right. gosh forbid, don't do anything wrong with them. They'll don't, don't try and change them. They're, they're, it's a whole other thing. I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a very unique art form. Like it's like, it's two dimensional yet. It, it has a function to it. So, I, and you know, we're talking yeah. about, functional pieces as well. They could be a yeah. wall hanging or gosh, yeah. you wipe your feet on it. I wouldn't want to do that, but it's kind of- I would be sad if someone did, but yeah. it, it is nice wool. So it yeah. feels think, good under bare feet. Yeah. Rug should be changed to wall hanging, I think. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, your, in, your, in your thing. I, I put rug because you said rug, but I think it should be wall hanging and it's a beautiful piece. Uh, Thank you very much. Oh yeah, we got another one. Yeah, this I, I miss it. Yeah, this one really sparkles. This is another another it's, rug, yes, but about it's another rug, a so little bit smaller, probably about 21, 22 inches wide, maybe yeah. twenty four. I can't yeah. remember. We're talking back a ways now. Um, this is the same technique, but using um, fabric strips. I hesitate to call them rags because I would dye them, hand dye them and whatnot, and, and cut them to the proper width and then use them within the rug. And as you can see, again, in the background, this time, because they're, they're fabric, they're too thick to make a pair of them go through at the same time. But I, I liked to dapple the background by changing colors as it went along. And the foreground, if you look at the purple flower and whatnot. Right, yeah. And the, green the, background, the background is nice because it does. it's not just one flat, field of color yeah like it's really yeah. got there's some depth in there and you can you definitely can see the uh the threads or the the fiber going back and forth across mm -hmm. the page it has a it has a nice what, what i used to call the swedish rule of color why use one when three will do <laughs> yes uh 
I want to go on here. I think we got another one here. This oh, is okay. This intrigued Go ahead. Me. Um, okay. I mean, we get a, this Latvian lady, and I don't have her name to put on there, but uh, for her credits, but I have never heard of you know Latvian textiles. And you know, you you hear about you know different um, origins of rug making and different things, and they're uh, you know. Uh, even our indigenous people in and the way they beaded and the way they do things, they have a structure that they work within that is part of their background. And uh, when you, and I heard this, so what is your connection with this? Uh, not necessarily this lady, but this, this technique. Well, with this lady and with the whole thing, um, I kind of fell into it and um, I was, learning I'd learned to weave a fair bit I let's see I went down to Toronto to go to a conference my first ever conference to learn about things from a rug weaver there and at the same time I went to the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto and by absolute sheer luck one of the really outstanding textile researchers of the time Dorothy Burnham was in the same department when I went there to visit because I wanted to see if they had a certain kind of weave structure in fabrics. I didn't know I was asking for anything Latvian. I was asking for this weave structure. While Dorothy was there, she took me under her wing. I, I was incredibly lucky. And she showed me their Latvian textile collection, which was there because the previous secretary of the department had been Latvian. And many Latvians emigrated to Canada and especially to Toronto. And she, this secretary, got behind them and said, the museum needs textiles in their collection. And they had a wonderful collection. And Dorothy showed me the boxes full of stuff and showed me how to analyze the fabrics. So when I finally went home, I could try to reproduce them. Unfortunately, something like these blankets in the foreground here, that orange and black one and the other one, have very complex looms com to make the patterns. But the lady I'm standing with is the mother of a f lady who became a dear friend of mine in town here in Saskatoon, Mrs. Elksness. She was from Latvia. Um, she was a nurse there during the Second World War. She and her two daughters escaped, well, didn't escape, they were herded out of Latvia into Germany. And um, eventually emigrated to Australia and eventually to Canada. And I needed someone to help, oh, sorry, one step back. I found these Latvian fabrics. Latvian is an impossible language, no offense, for an outsider to learn to read or speak. Oh it is not based on anything that we know in English or French or anything. So I needed someone to help me read the few little Latvian weaving books I could find. and. I finally found my friend Via Rots in town here who worked at the university and she helped me translate these books. She didn't know anything about weaving. I didn't know anything about Latvian. We got along just fine. Her mother, the lady in the picture came visiting. We got out a bunch of the things. Some of these were on loan actually from um, the Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, some had been sent to me by people I inquired about textiles they had donated to the museum, they sent me textiles. So we just put them around like this to take a picture of them. And that was one of the big stages of learning. And I got really hooked on these Latvian textiles. I was going around North America teaching weaving at the time. And I'd mentioned this and people would say, oh, well, what's, tell us more, tell us more. Why don't you write it up? Right. <laughs> well, yeah, right. That started. And then in 1986, the first computer program came out where I could enter the pattern of one of these fabulous pictures, you know, like the orange one there. I could enter the whole pattern on a graph and tell, and tell it, okay, how was it threaded? And it would tell me how to thread the loom and, and weave the pattern. However, don't forget, garbage in, garbage out. So if I didn't thread the, if I didn't put the right graph in, it didn't tell me the right answer. Anyway, I, I eventually built up a book out of that. And um, 
So the, the hand, the, have... your hand woven book. This no, is the book. It's oh, there Joy it is. Forever, Latvian Weaving. Oh. Okay. And yeah, it's a real book. And it's pages and pages about, I mean, look at all that. This, yeah. this was all in DOS, believe it or not. So, this was back with the first, first computers. I, I had, well, I started it in 86. It finally got published in 91. And along the way, I adapted things because I didn't really want to weave just standard things. As you say, we love to experiment. And one that I adapted was the rug shown in the lower right picture here on the cover of the handwoven magazine. Um, here's the rug. Can people I think maybe get this? you know larger visual guys if you're there you could choose that. That's okay. One of James You can uh, see you can see the close up of it. You can see how I put in little extra go. colors. Wow. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that that looks yeah, and it feels heavy. It looks heavy. It's it's fabric strips. It is heavy. It's reversible, and well, you can see how big yeah. it is. Wow. And that was one of the first adaptations I made based on there uh, on, on a an aspect of Latvian fabrics, and they so were so that, pleased with it at Handel. There it is. So is that book available? Sorry, go ahead. Is your book still available? I have. I have about a dozen copies left, and they're pretty much all that's left because the publishers got sold three times, and the last ones, without asking me, destroyed all the remaining copies. Oh, dear. And it was heartbreaking. But yeah. I've got, as I say, I've got about 12 copies left. They're for sale on my website. And I mean, um, yeah. after that, well, that's we'll it. Well, promote that for people that can look to maybe find that. Yeah, so let's, let's let's we can move on here to your. Okay, right. Okay, we're moving on. This is now. I have, I've developed the, the Latvian interlacements. That's all that I, really ever took along was the interlacements. I loved their patterns and everything, but that wasn't my my world. Um, and so this is what would have resulted, from that very first picture you showed of me painting on the loom. So this is a painted because one. This is on This is the... this is a this is a fiber piece that is about um, thirty inches wide, and you can see the painted parts of it. Well, the whole thing is painted. It's what gives it the whole background glow, right. and it, where the sun is, that's pure painting. And then it was woven with textured threads down you can see them in the the ground there in the sh deepest shadow area there's some turquoisey sort of threads across the shadows those are all textured threads that are woven in there's actually quite a few in here but they don't show up because it's such a big picture you know it's, it's such a large picture that they're they're over they're, they're very subtle within it yeah then well, just, came the, the sorry go ahead so we're looking at the very fine detail of the, the grasses. Are, are those woven yeah. in as well? So to get no, that no, that's that's the that's the embroidery. That's the free motion that's embroidery. The free motion embroidery on top of it. And in fact, if you look just to the right of the sun, there's some green leaves in front of a tree there, uh, right. bright bright yellow almost leaves. You can see the stitching there going in a whole different direction from being the grasses down below. That's right. all surface em embroidery. Right. Well, and then up in the heavy um, top story of the trees, those dark leaves, that's painting. Okay, so those are thread painted. That, yeah. that's, that's what happens with the threads when they get painted. They, they give that streaky ECAT look. Uh, ECAT being dyed threads that are, are, they sort of shift while you're moving because mm. threads are almost alive while you're weaving them. They, they, the tension on them changes. Every mm. single thread changes just a little bit from its neighbor. And that gives that wonderful blurred streaky look. Yeah. No, it, and, it, and it has a bit of a three-dimensional feel to the, the full yeah. work of that yeah. because of the bulk of the thread. And uh, yeah, but it's yeah. But I can see that you know that that line aspect that's happening with the work. But it's very very fine, and yeah. the, 
And I, I love that softening, I guess it's the softening of the page with the uh, free motion, the, the threading in the foreground of the grasses. That kind of adds that other layer that, you know, you mm -hmm. were, you definitely are working in layers, just like an artist would work in a painting. You work yes. in layers and, yep. but thinking you've got to really think backwards and forwards like this thing. So a watercolor background, <laughs> Well, you, yes. you, you know, sort of like doing a watercolor, you, it can get muddy real quick. If you don't have a plan, yeah. you need a plan yeah. with this one. Uh, you can't yeah. just say, I'm just going to start putting some trees down and there's, you know, everything oh. will just fall into place oh. and I'll fix it up no. later. You know, it doesn't work. Yeah. It doesn't a, lot, work. a lot of ripping too. A lot oh, of yeah. the embroidery would get ripped out um, as I made decisions. But this is, anyway, yeah. this, this one actually was very popular. It, it won a major award in, in the Saskatchewan Craft Council exhibition uh, called Dimensions. Yeah. And um, it, it's, yeah, it, it really has a glow about it that I'm very, was very, am very pleased with. It's like a glow like on me. I got this glow, like green glow. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yep. Oh, dear. It's, yeah, let's see what else we got here. Oh, another piece. Oh, so we're moving okay. your, your different mediums that you're working in now. So yeah. we, we've, we've well, gone through some of the, uh, I guess we'll call it the you know, early stages of weaving, like, and the technical aspects with Latvian ones. And now that stuff is used, the technology has been used to build this last piece that we looked at. And, yeah. and now we're working into collage. Yep, because after 40 years of weaving, my wrists, my back, and my knees all said, oh, that's quite enough, thank you. <laughs> Time to move on. And yeah. I, I, you could say it's making lemonade out of lemons, but in fact, there are limitations of any medium. And I was starting to feel limited by what I was making. Uh, I was slowing down on... on on feeling inspired, let's put it that way. Right. And I was starting to use some, for instance, uh, watercolor pencils on the warp, maybe after it came off the loom, after the picture was, was woven and everything. I was, I was starting to accent it with other things, but the weaving physical activities were getting more and more difficult. And I just decided that's it. I have to quit. So in 2011, that was my decision. In 2012, I had a huge studio sale I couldn't look at a yarn or thread shop for about five years after that without feeling that my heart was twanging, <laughs> but it's, it's okay now. And I'm, I realized one of the things I need is to have my hands involved in what I'm doing. I really am a tactile person. And so when I stopped painting on the loom, I went to doing straight acrylic paintings. However, that paled for me because it just wasn't hands-on enough. Right. And so I started working with some collage of uh, this particular one has gel mediums and oriental papers collaged in. When I say collage, I don't mean cutting out something from a magazine and putting it down. Uh, that's a whole different kind of collage. But for me, I'm still working with building the image and simply building the materials to make the image. Okay, so this um, is material based, this piece. This is material based. I, for me, the message and the medium and the materials and the skills all have to work together. And cutting things out and, well, also I'm, I'm a, a fanatic, especially coming from the textile background with um, not necessarily archival, Lord knows who, what's going to last for 50 years, but I don't want something to fade or, or break down in five or 10 years. Right. So I'm quite, quite careful about what goes into anything I make. So this is, is acrylic materials uh, and, and various papers, and it's all sealed and varnished, the whole thing, because that matters to me. Yeah. So yeah, collage, this, uh, yeah. go ahead. Collage go has ahead. a tactile feel to it because they're, Oh yes, yeah, yes. In the layering and collage, you know, every wrinkle, every rock laid in over top of the other one has a bit of three dimensionality to it. So exactly, yeah. So you, 
your 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 not only the color palette, it's nice and warm color palette, but you have uh, still that depiction of trees, landscape, which is consistent through your work. And it's just, you've just changed it up a little bit. And I think, um, I, you're right, you know, after 40 years of doing something the same over and over, it wears on our bodies and our, and our hands and our wrists and our knees. I mean, if you stand at the easel for 40 years, you got to sit down at some point, you know, there's, there's a... <laughs> Well, yes. A lot of us. Uh, I work in a studio with a concrete floor, so I'll wear a rubber shoe. You, you have to, yeah. or, or you have rubber mats to be on for that many years of standing. So you had an easel or yeah. whatever you're going to do. But the eyes also. I don't know how your eyes could put up with all that needlework. It's such fine work um, that you're you're always you know looking at things like that. But yes. <laughs> I, I looked at blur images. I just blur images. That's right. <laughs> that, that's nice. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. No, my optometrist and I had a very close relationship for several years. <laughs> I, stronger, I, I, was, I, kept, I kept going until I said, I can't see it this way. And he said, all right, we'll try again. And he was wonderful. And it worked. He didn't just get that one light that hangs over in the big eyepiece. That's no, the, no, no, no. He, he gave that up pretty quickly. <laughs> my office thing that you can peek through to look at the yep. little threads. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now you're delving into some printmaking. Like, and I think yep. that's probably the direction where you're going now. You know, so I'm seeing this journey that you've been on, which is a lovely journey to see where you started in can and how it's transformed people understanding that this can happen exactly with your lives as well. You know, when you're in the industry for 40 or 50 years, you understand you might start someplace, but it's going to, it will be carried. The information you learn at those early stages will affect what you do in your later works. You know, Absolutely. that knowledge that you gain in the beginning will become invaluable as you discover That's new right. things and things along the way. So That's I right. love auto printing. I mean, uh, it's one of my favorite things for discovery, for new color palettes, and for just the line and texture that you can get from it. So can you tell us about the, what your discoveries here? Well, the collages were fine and are fine. I still am doing them. But I I took printmaking back at university, and I really liked I liked it very much, especially the etching and the silk screening. And I was just, I don't know quite how it came about, but I happened to run across monotype in some book recent, um, much more recently. And we'd never done that back in the class I took. So I was looking into it and thinking, well, this is a way that it could work. Um, this is in acrylics, paints. Uh, I, I work in a studio in my home. I don't, well, we live in the country, so we have our own septic system. I don't want to dump nasty chemicals in there. And I don't really like the idea of working in oil-based things because that's not great either. Uh, so I wanted something I could work in my acrylics. And I found that this appealed a great deal. And talk about hands-on. Um, it's my painting. It's m looser than painting. I like that very much. Yeah. And I love that the textures every time will surprise you yeah, again will. it's very much in layers layers upon layers yeah so do you this do a start with pardon Sorry, go ahead do you have a registration system that you use at all for uh actually <laughs> it, it's of sorts um my system is that i have a large glass plate which is firmly on the table Underneath, I put what I call a cartoon. That's a leftover from textile terminology. It's a guide. And to the left side of it, I, well, actually over the, the, the guide, I place the paper or canvas that I'm going to print on and tape it along the left edge so that it folds back like the cover of a book. There's my registration. That's all you need. And yeah. that's all I need, if I'm careful. And... Um, then I paint with acrylics on the glass plate using, I've developed a lot of experiments, of course. Gosh, I've got tons of experiments. But I've, uh, I've developed a mix of acrylic bases and retarders so that I put some of that on the plate. For instance, where I'm going to put 
first the the stream i use, i start with the light colors work toward the dark colors just like in watercolor like water and yep. and um put in just that area with this stuff on the glass then paint into that with my acrylics because they're going even well open acrylics are fine except they take so long to dry once they're on the paper so i really want something a little faster drying than that but not as fast as heavy body acrylics so i've made this mix that i can paint into and it holds the paint wet long enough for me to then flip the paper over pick up the blue flip it back and i look at it and i say okay i didn't like that or i do like that because you never quite know what's going to come out yeah and i found you learn, that, you learn but my mono prints are mostly with oils uh, that i do but uh, I found acrylics dried too quickly, even with uh, retarders. Okay. Sometimes one edge would catch and then not print in mm -hmm. another area because you spent too much time in another right. corner. <laughs> but right. uh, when you're working on larger pieces. but So do you hand rub these things? Are they hand rubbed or are they run through a press? They're absolutely, they're hand rubbed, yes. Sometimes I joke because one I, I tried getting various tools to use to press, uh, to press on them. And one of them is a big crystal glass um, candle base and on the bottom it's etched in Oleg Cassini so that's my Oleg Cassini printer but in fact I don't use it very much I mostly just hand rub yeah you use some kind of big wine decanter to rub on that or something <laughs> and and so I work up and if you look on the left hand half well the upper right all those greens and things that's an effect I love that you can get in mono printing because it it it's unlike watercolors it looks like watercolors at first until you realize you couldn't do that with a brush and then you get into the tree and no you're not able to do that with a brush that's got to be picked up ad adhesive like like ripping off a band-aid parts of it stay on your skin well you pick it up off off the glass and you get these wonderful interrupted colors yeah. Yeah. and that's one of the things i love about these mono prints People realize that you you can paint on mylars as well, so you don't yes. need to have yes, a absolutely you have a yes shiny surface basically. The problem was uh, something something that that doesn't adhere to the the well in my case the acrylic, as long as you've got a very smooth surface. Yes, right. my, I, only, yeah, the only mylar thing is great. You realize with some mylars they do carry an oil base in them, and water will puddle or water base will puddle on there if there's not enough color with it, there's too much water. So you have to eventually, yes. eventually break down that barrier on that, you know, keep yes. using it, then it will right. uh, retain and hold uh, yeah. the, the pigment on it. But I, I tend to yeah. use a mylar, which has got a bit of a tooth to it. So there, ah, there's yes. some heavier yeah. mylars that are out there that you can look around and for printmaking. There, there's a lot of variety of it available. And, and in fact, you you can even use um, what do you call it um, the the um, three or three ring binder sleeves if oh. you want to just experiment you could use one of those um, it it just it it's very very simple um, what's nice about it is you can work at your kitchen table if you really want that's it, right. you stay to that eight and a half eleven format from a from a sleeve that's right that, and it works great and. Uh, tape the thing to the table and like you said, do your mono print and then you can clean up and make supper from there. So that's right. That's I had right. to do that. I had to do that for years, not necessarily make supper, but the, uh, <laughs> before I had a studio, I, 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 most of my work was done at the kitchen table in my earlier years until I got pushed down into the basement. And then I finally got out of the basement. <laughs> but I thought it was in heaven when I had all that room in the basement. I should point out that, when you do a monotype, these are monotypes. They are absolutely one of a kind. You're never going to reproduce this thing. You, uh, if you used something that, um, like if you used a stencil in part of it, then you'd start calling it a mono print because part of it you can reproduce again and try something different. Yeah. You can change part of it, but not all of it. But these, if you paint them like this, that's it. You're a, you have a totally unique product. It just depends whether your substrate absorbs all the pigment or not. Sometimes you can, I'll, with oil paint, I found that I could pull a ghost proof. I'll put it through my printing press yes. and I'll pull a um, ghost proof from it. But you can also 
mask can do a bunch of different things where you can inset different things and color. To, it's really a versatile medium if people want to really it is. definitely get a book it's on very, mono, yeah mono printing book at the at your either go to the library you can find, actually online there's probably all kinds of uh, there's a lot of information online yeah. yes so excellent information in fact yeah now, this is yeah. another one of your prints here just yeah this is one of my favorites <laughs> yeah. well the green stuff uh, you know, green, green is really tough like it's a tough color for a lot of artists uh, you know, yeah. part of it is because maybe it's a little too acidic. Uh, they don't, you know, the difference between blue greens and yellow greens, right? Understanding that color palette of how to differentiate them uh, to depict what you want to do. So do you use colored papers at all or are you on white, mostly no. on white cotton paper? No, I, you, I try to use it as white as I can for most things. Yes. Yeah, you need that reflection um, like in watercolor. So is it a watercolor paper you use mostly? Or Usually, paper. yes. Okay. No, they're, they're watercolor. Uh, yeah. Printmaking often um, pill too much. If I use a good hot press watercolor paper, I can actually lift some of the color out of it if I'm, sometimes. Oh, okay. While, yeah. the, while, while the acrylic is still wet, if I carefully get it wet with another stiff brush, I can dab out some of the color if I need to. Which yeah. especially is handy if you make the big mistake of putting a little bit of a drip of color around the margin. <laughs> I learned, you know, learning that this is a great thing to try, but when doing it, don't put too much pigment on, especially if you, it'll squish out yes. on you, right? And that's Oh, a, yes. It's a learned thing that the amount of stiffness that's in your right. pigment is better to do multiple layers than to say, I'm going to get it down in yes. one push because it... That's right. I, yeah, that's right. It becomes a Th this present one probably had at least a hundred pulls. Oh, that's another thing I do for real finer detail work. Those mylar sheets you're talking about. Um, actually, you can even use like what strawberries come in or something like those plastic containers. Mm -hmm. Cut out the flat part, clean it up really nicely, and then you can. I can at least with acrylics use that as what I call small plates, and I do the painting on that and then put it onto the picture where I exactly where I want it. I can see where it's going. So they work. And like that's a, how I get. They kind of work like a stamp. That's right. Except it's the paint. And again, you have to be very careful about the quantity of paint on that plate, but you can at least place it just where you want it. Yeah. Cause you can see. It's how I get the lines. Yeah. For positioning. So if you had to inset a yeah. color into an area or do something. Yeah. Specific, yeah. You can. Yeah. It's really all sometimes the, it's very important to have all, exactness. All these little techniques that we, I guess, pick up over the years from doing things. Yeah, right. So another another right. one, here, uh, uh, I call it a you call it a textured print, but along with your yeah. some of your plein air sketching. So basically, you you can wander your two hundred acres you have access to and and choose yeah. your trees. And I, I mean, these are lovely. You'd be able to sit down and just go and sketching for part of the day or morning when the light oh, is yes. bright. And, uh, I way. love it. Yeah. 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 And lovely. this one is only, the, the print is only eight by 10 inches. It's on a piece of paper that it's a piece of watercolor paper, but then on top of it is a complete coverage from a very textured oriental washi or whatever you want to call it, rice paper. Or people have different names for it, but you can see there's a, a bunch of little, little linear things that caught paint next to other areas where the paint didn't go. Right. And and on top of that, with the dappling that you can get as you pick, as you move the paper off the plate, um, it gives a really um, ultra textured effect look that I really like. Yeah. No, it's got a really nice sense of light. You know, and you get a little bit of sky coming through. And you know, a lot of times they get a little flattened up a little bit too much. But this one, you can kind of move between the trees, and 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 Thank you're not you. feeling you're not feeling like it's really you're closed in. Like it feels like this beautiful little alcove that you can you can sit a in. A little and, place and, of peace. Well, you know, the sun. If people understand when you go for those walks, why what's enjoyable while I walk, and it's the way the light goes in between all the little areas and it gives depth, yeah. but it also these beautiful little spots of light that, uh, that the trees let into, into the area that light up the, for the ground. And 
and the forest floor and this one's not so much a forest floor but it's just the you know in the i guess it is a a forest in itself it's more of a, bo a boreal forest i guess it would be the poplar trees and such. well put well put this this one won best in excellence in printmaking in a big show so i was really pleased i don't know how many more of those i'll do but uh, that's just it. I keep experimenting. And this is another one. Um, I went out and did a, a out in another area around us, um, a more Vista like drawing, uh, pen and ink. And then I came back and um, eventually printed it on watercolor paper. If you look around the especially the top left corner where the shadowing is better, you can see the, the decal edge of the watercolor paper inside yeah. the white of the canvas, which this is glued to. Yeah. So this is a piece of watercolor paper on canvas. Yeah. Okay. okay, watercolor paper adhered to canvas. Right, and, and the watercolor paper had been printed with selected lines from the sketch that I made on site. Oh, okay. So laser print, laser, laser print, no, no inkjet in this sort of stuff. Okay. Because I'm then using acrylics on it. And that would smear the inkjet to pieces. Oh dear! So, um, yeah. <laughs> well, it well, might be an interesting effect. Well, the technologies yeah. you know that we're using, I think, is we got to use the tools we've yeah. been given, uh, yeah. and, and the ability for what you want to do. And they all offer yeah. different options. I love the line structure in these. You can feel the brush strokes, and it feels it just feels a little English like, you know. I think. Yes. Well, it it, it was a nice valley. And it's also what you can't really see on here. It's actually a, a collage too, because all those trees in the foreground and the little stand of trees in the center and then off to the upper right, with the, the, it has uh, scratched out white tree trunks in it. All of those are a little bit raised up because they're a very, very soft, fine uh, paper, which was pre-painted and then glued onto this with acrylic oh. medium yeah. so it's actually textured beyond its surface oh, and no i it, love that just... i love the deckled edge look of the piece too so not everything's crisp thank up you. In order i think it it floats nicely in the in the page center thank you i'm very pleased to hear that i get very little feedback <laughs> from from anybody really because um there's a very limited area in which to display uh, my work. I just did get into an, a nice new little gallery in, in the city here called the Dandelion. And there, that place is really encouraging me to do my sketches and watercolors, which no one has ever done before. Yeah. And it, it, it depends on where you're trying to show. Some places only want prints. Some places don't want prints on and on like that. That's and I'm not doing any fabric. Yeah, that's the way the galleries are. And if you're doing something... That's really, the way they are. If you're doing something really different than somebody else, you have to find the right gallery for you. Uh, yeah, and, uh, and especially with COVID, there's oh. fewer and fewer galleries around. There is. Okay, bit. this is a watercolor. Uh, this is the sort of thing I do out in the woods when I'm just sketching. Uh, it, it's pen and ink and watercolor. And... You know, to me, there's a whole story in those trees. I, I, I really, really like them. the magic of three. You know that you, too. That too. Magic. Yeah, I thought about it. I could almost just do the left one, but it, it's <laughs> really nice with all three. And I, I really, really love doing these things. But as I say, no one's encouraged me to do them since I think ninth grade was my last time my art teacher. Oh dear, had me doing watercolor pen and inks uh that's a long time ago yeah. and well, we, well, so we, i'm suddenly getting i'm suddenly doing these things and i'm very much enjoying them you well know, we can talk you can talk about your art when we can, but i think it's i think there's always room for better and more like there always is like and i think we can always tune up things but i love seeing the journey from where the early stages and You've kind of loosened up a little bit more, and I like that part of your Absolutely. career, and it's it's ongoing. And uh, I think it's, I guess, 
I, I love seeing the freshness of the work and uh, it's beautiful stuff. Thank you. Sure. Hey, Stephen, how are you doing? I like it. I thought it was Please. great. David sends his apologies. Unfortunately, now that we've become a real entertainment company, we only have 19 of the thousand shows. So he's like, I have to go do this. I'm like, I will send your apologies. Really, he just probably Thank had you. a little bit of the loo, but we don't know. Because, um, you know, he's old. But no, so I love your work. I was listening and, and the weaving. I I had a friend of mine who um, was from the Middle East, and they taught me about weaving. So I know what goes into that. So he was. they were very, like, meticulous. And in, in theirs, it was like the story and the picture and the cult. It was a whole thing. So I can appreciate that. And your paintings are gorgeous. or watercolors. So the question I always Thank ask you. everybody is, what are the cost if someone wants to buy something from you other than the book which they can oh. get online so to speak but if someone wants to buy a watercolor or a weave what are the, what's your range from x to z um okay a, mm -hmm. a watercolor unframed 150 canadian um canadian yeah six dollars and fifty way US. down okay. there from us right, right. yes. <laughs> 30 percent off from Cana from us at least um there you go Weavings would be the most expensive, but right. there's very few left. They're hand. If if you go to my website www.janeevans.ca, the link will be below. And it's just okay. It's just two e's in the middle. Right. Jane Evans. Um, all, anything for sale or most things for sale are, are on there. But anyway, the weavings right. there's very few left, and they're handled by mostly by Saskatchewan Network for Art Collecting. And then the okay. Dandelion Gallery handles some of my stuff. Other prices are on my website. Probably around, mm, okay, hold it. <laughs> um, okay, that textured print that Paul was going on about with the yellow background and all, uh, $410 framed. Canadian, okay. 410 Okay. Can't go wrong with that. That looks pretty nope, good. Nope, can't. Well, we'll I, put I'd James link to make below. Them accessible. Yes, Pardon? we'll put your link below. Um, okay, thank you. And on your and on your website, I can't find um, the weave. Oh, the fiber art. There it is. I'm sorry. Look, I'm unfortunately, as of that. yesterday, one of right. the apps on my website updated oh. my galleries, and it entered a, a fatal error within it. So they okay. haven't fixed it yet. I can't okay. fix it. Well, We're waiting. I apologize well, very let's, much. Let's, I couldn't let's, believe let's it did so. that to me. Yeah. That's because you're, no. you're, we want your site for people can watch. So we'll put the site up there. Yeah. So it, it, should, it should be up and working it. within a couple of days totally. Okay. Well, they have till tomorrow. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell them. You, there you go. Jane, it has been an absolute delight. Thank you so much. Well, I enjoyed you. listening to you and, and hearing the process. It was very cool. And I liked enjoying and looking at the weaves. I thought those were great. So, well, thank you okay. very much. It's been yeah. my pleasure. And yeah, thank you, thank Paul. You. No, thank you very much for this enjoyable conversation. Yeah. I love seeing your work, and uh, we'll see more of your work. You get see a couple of shows. Yeah. Let me know. And yep. We can pop around to look and see what you're doing. Okay. You have a thank great you, day. Everybody. Thank you. Have a good one. Don't forget Bye. to like and subscribe, and Jane's website will be below. There we go.